mental health professionals because my daughter just left for sleepaway camp. And so I'm like, I'm crushed. So I'm glad you all are here for me. Thank you. Try to arrange this knowing that uh, being a leader in mental health, my fragile self-esteem and, uh, you know, sense of self. So I'm struggling. It's hurt, but that's not why we're here. Obviously, I ate lots of brain food to deal with those feelings. We're here to talk about nutritional psychiatry and uh, to share with you, you know, just some info about what uh, is emerging. It's called nutritional psychiatry and nutritional psychology because a lot of us do the same thing. I'm mostly a therapist. I prescribe some meds, but, um, you know, the, the, so I'm going to be calling it nutritional psychiatry. I hope you'll forgive that because I'm a psychiatrist and if I don't, they come for me. Um, but I'm really thrilled to be with you here. Uh, we have some info about our training course, uh, 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 which is uh, basically for clinicians around nutritional psychiatry. It's now missing one randomized trial that just came out. But I wanted to go through my slide deck. You're all mental health folks, so we're going to burn through that kind of quickly. And then I'm really interested to take your questions and see if we can get a little conversation going. We have a really nice clinician community, and I just love hearing from folks around the country in terms of what's what's happening in terms of uh, their practice, nutrition, what people are seeing. I think nutrition is one of the things in healthcare that can be very frustrating and even uh, annoying. I just saw a patient today I've known for probably over a decade got depression, some pointed up on like a little bit of stimulant, helped out some organization, not much. Then she met a keto weight loss specialist who um, has someone, physician prescribing now, like, I don't know, I think it's about 80 milligrams of Adderall a day. And she feels great. She feels great. She's lost a lot of weight. But, it, you know, what am I trying to say here? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to say food and mental health are complicated and um all of our patients are trying all kinds of different diets, getting all kinds of different influence. There's a lot of now psychiatric medications, Wellbutrin, the antidepressant, um, uh, Vivance, a stimulant package uh, now FDA approved for bulimia. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of mix of psychiatric medications, psychiatric and mental health disorders in food. So this is all now being called nutritional psychiatry. I'm gonna pull up my slide deck and it's just, uh, it's nice to see so many of you here. All right. So let's go through some slides, everyone. I'm going to also open up the chat. You can drop, drop questions in the chat. I'll try and be a good 2020 speaker. I realize, sorry, my office is under construction. So you get to see a picture of me as a child appealing to all of those who are psychodynamically inclined. So we're going to talk about how to feed your mental health. I'm also interested, all of you who are clinicians and mental health providers or in mental health, I'm also curious about you feeding your brain. This isn't just for our patients, as you'll hear me say, you know, I think all of us with the brain. I've spent most of my career in Manhattan. I'm not sure what happened. Now I'm in rural Wyoming. So we can talk about that after you guys help me with my daughter going away to camp. But this is all to say, these are my patients getting gobbled up this is a bad fantasy I'm having. I don't know why it's my first slide. Somebody should help me with this. Uh, saying, you know, of course you feel great. These are loaded with antidepressants. Just to say you are what you eat. And we know this applies to our physical health. We often don't apply it to our mental health. Or if we do, it's extreme, right? Never eat this food and it's all good. You never have to see the therapist again. Um, so quickly, my disclosures, I don't take money from big pharma, either with the F or the PH. Uh, I tried to take money from big kale, they don't have a lot of money, to be honest. Um, I, I do some work with Men's Health Magazine, mainly trying to get men to talk more about mental health. And it's kind of, I think, growing. John men first was the first. Uh, yeah, John first was the first time for the men. I think somebody's got their There you go. Male mental health just becoming an increasingly interesting issue uh, um, under talk, not talked about. And, and that's we're trying to change that. You now I have over 60 conversations um, around male mental health that's on the Instagram TV or the. Um, and recorded Instagram live. So if you're familiar with Instagram, you like male mental health, check out Friday sessions. Um, we've got all, just all kinds of interesting men who get them talking about their mental health. It's really, so as a clinician, it's it's interesting on this live platform, somebody really disclosing and talking openly about bipolar disorder or panic disorder. So it's really interesting. We're not going to talk about meds. I am a, an author of cookbooks and, and uh, so uh, just, you know, I think you should listen to what I say with some scrutiny. And that's why I brought all the evidence. But these are the books. Uh, I had a kale mania. I probably have eaten more kale than, than certainly anyone in the Zoom room, I would bet. 
if you want to throw down, I'll see you in my DMs. Um, but I got really interested in nutritional psychiatry when I was a resident. I was like a low fat vegetarian uh, back in the day. I was at Columbia, I started residency in 2000. And uh, just was interesting. We didn't talk at all about food in, in medical school or in residency. And that doesn't make a lot of sense given that we know uh, what we know about the brain. Oh, sorry, I'm having some, there we go. Now, this is uh, caught on. Uh, these are some of the, these are just in the New York Times articles that have been over the last few years around nutritional psychiatry and some of the work that we've done in our clinic, which is nice now to have some legitimacy. It's now called nutritional psychiatry. Um, it wasn't really called psychiatry is making the news increasingly. And this is where I'm from. I grew up in rural Indiana and it just, I want you to know that because you're mental health professionals, but also really shapes how I think about food and how I think about mental health. And, and I guess how, what I hope people hear in my message, which is a real desire to have things around nutrition and food be equitable and be accessible to everyone. Uh, a lot of times um, being in New York, you, you see the, you know, looks like it can just, just like expensive, fancy organic food. And that's really not what nutritional psychiatry is about. But coming from rural Indiana, it was really interesting to move to New York about, I don't know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, as these two really uh, big movements were starting. We started caring about where our food came from. This whole farm to table movement was just taking a hold. There were, went um, from 2000 to like 2010, we kind of got, uh, went up by a factor of 10 in terms of the number of farmers markets in America, from about 1,000 to almost 10,000. Farms started popping up like this. this is the Brooklyn Grange Farm in New York City. So really wonderful place for event. Great sunset photo, by the way. My favorite kale salad I ever made is on this roof. The fastest farm to table kale salad in New York City. It was about 20 minutes from harvest to uh, table. Uh, and it only moved a couple hundred feet, but great event space. But just to kind of illustrate a psychiatrist on a rooftop garden talking about mental health and food, that, that's, a, that's a pretty cool thing that's going on. And in some ways, this is some of the start of nutritional psychiatry for me. It was really seeing how interested people were about food and mental health, comparing that to just when we presented as mental health. Now, it's important we talk about all this. Uh, now, we're mental health people, so it's just the feelings, right? It's like all these numbers, I don't care. It's just the feeling. People's feelings are hurt, and people are more than feelings are hurt. People are struggling with emotional health. You see that happen in one family, it's enough cost, right? But a trillion dollars worldwide is lost to productivity. That's just the, the cost of disability, just of depression. Look at the economic burden. I mean, I think this is some of the critique of our field that we can't prove great efficacy and we're super expensive. I, I'm definitely in that category, unfortunately, although I think I can prove some efficacy, uh, but $100 billion in the last decade of, of added cost. We all tried out the statistic. I hate the statistic. One in five of us have a mental illness. So those like 80% of you that don't really, I guess, need to pay attention to this talk because you're so mentally healthy. I just don't like this because I think it really creates stigma and people miss the each year part. You know, because if a fifth of us are getting mental health diagnosis each year, that means at the end of the decade, pretty much everybody, except those, I don't know, really defended people are going to have some sort of issue. So I like saying five out of five of us have a human brain. We've not really been taught a lot about sort of how to feed it, how to nourish it. Uh, and, and a lot of things us as mental health prof professionals know, it's a little fragile. If you don't actively take care of it, if you don't actively pursue mental health and mental fitness, uh, usually you're going to not have as good of a course with your mental health as you could. We know, unfortunately, even with the, and I don't mean to say our treatments are expensive and not efficacious. I'm a little critical of, of all of us, myself included. But uh, even with, with the great treatments we do have, people don't come to see us. You look at a low and middle income countries that don't really even have mental health care systems often. Half of our kids don't come. 60% of adults don't come to treatment. It's like 80% of men who have mental health disorders don't uh, get treatment. So this is one of those places where food plays an important role because psychiatry has done a crummy job in terms of preventative public health, right? We kind of wait until people fall apart. And then we're there with you know, oftentimes treatments like medications that people have a lot of concerns with. So this started to change as we began to think about food and as the field moved really from thinking about single nutrients, like does B12 matter for depression? If you have low B12, what happens? All important questions, but what really matters is your dietary pattern. And you've seen this mostly in the research of the Mediterranean dietary pattern, but that just being the day in, day out, what are the types of foods you eat? We started seeing an effect on the brain really, you know, interest 
primarily from the dementia world initially, uh, but rapidly moving into the depression world with a lot of correlational data coming out starting in about 2000 and I'd say eight, and then the randomized trials. So we're gonna go through all those really quickly and then I'm gonna take some questions. Now I've got this book out, so I just wanna plug my book for a second. It's full of drawings and illustrations just like this. And these are the power players. I bring these out now just in case you get distracted, you have a patient emergency, you need just a moment to take some breaths, which I take your bio break. If, if I'm the only break in all your patients and you're in the Zoom cage, like Zoom room, sorry, not Zoom cage. Uh, these are the foods we're gonna talk about. And I mainly put them up because like, if some of these are surprising to you, I think that's great. And I had some curiosity and I hope by the end of the talk, it'll be really clear why all of these foods are not just like the dark chocolate's not a marketing gimmick. I really think it's great for your brain health. Your brain's hungry. These are our hungriest neurons. You think we'd learn more about how to feed them. And we kind of, especially if all of us in mental health, right? You know, it's kind of like, I don't know if you were a mechanic and cars came in broken and you people like, are you feeding, you know, what are you putting there? And like, I put in some water. I put in some vegetable oil in my car. You know, it's a nice car. It's a race car, but I just, I put whatever I find in there. Your mechanic would be like, put the good stuff. This is a race car. You know, your, your brain's a race car. So I don't, it's strange, but 420 calories a day, right? For a lot of Americans, the majority of that is added fats and added sugars, no nutrients, right? So that's really the issue with this model American diet. Mostly fat for Americans, and this is our brain, it's mostly fat. So Americans, that's mostly the wrong fats. Um, and then your brain's made a lot of these PUFAs, that's fancy way said, omega-3 fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids. One way to think about those is energetically. Uh, not just because I love my crystals, but also because uh, there, it, it helps to sort of understand the chemistry of how reactive they are. That's why fish smells faster than beef, right? It goes off because that's the, that fishy smell is it, the fish, the fat's oxidizing. And that's the, mostly the DHA, the longest fat we eat, which is mostly in seafood. Now, I've used these, this phrase, it doesn't have a definition. So it's one of the early players in the space. I've made this slide. <laughs> this is how I define nutritional psychiatry, which is all of us, patients, people, moms, dads, kids, trying to use nutrition to optimize your brain health. I think that's the best part of you. Um, and to treat and prevent mental health disorders. And as I said, the treatment studies, we're going to go over them. They're all augmentation studies, which I like. It's not going to put us out of business, but it's going to help us get more people better. And then prevention. Like I said, we just, I think you have to do a better job. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> There's like a coating of pollen this thick outside here uh, I'm in the mountains of Wyoming. And like the season is so short and the summer. So when the rain comes and it gets warm, everything, it's like, it's time. So um, this was the first paper in the space, uh, Lancet Psychiatry. And I was lucky. These are all like the big players in uh, nutritional psychiatry. I was lucky to squeeze in here. Um, it was a group paper and we were just saying, hey, the rest of medicine gets to talk about food. We should in psychiatry. So this is really our question. We're going to go through the data. Can you do this? Can you build it by starting with this like more resilient brain? Um, if we eat these fatty fish and rainbow vegetables, a little dark chocolate, what happens? And, and uh, I think we should be, you know, uh, critical. I mean, chocolate cake's delicious. And, you know, there's no chocolate cake. I like French fries. I like hamburgers. I like all of the modern American food. You might not know that thinking I'm a brain food guy. So can I just eat that? And this old new noodle will just keep perking along. Now we're going to talk a lot. Uh, oh gosh, there, I didn't, I forgot to put the slide. As I told everybody who's here early, my daughter just left for summer camp. <sighs> Sorry, I'm sort of not kidding. It's hard. She's 11 now. So anyway, that's my sweet little bear. And we're on the back porch here. This is a story of a young doctor and his daughter. And it's not a story of DHA and B12. It's a story of what happens when we just think about food as nutrients that we miss this. We miss what's going on here in the back porch. This young guy and his cute little bubba, and they're eating mussels not only because the DHA and the B12 and seafood's known to really have a positive effect on the brain health of children, not that, uh, we're also like being silly and bonding and, and he's feeling like a engaged dad. So all of those have really good mental health effects. And, and just to sort of note, we're gonna talk about nutrition and dietary pattern, but you know, the part about food that's also great about mental health <clears throat> is us not having a pathological, guilty, neurotic, awful relationship with food. 
And, and I'm sure we all see these in our practices. Those of your clinician, we all see these in our own lives, right? You hear some things a toxin, you start to worry. Anybody with kids, you know, it, it's there's a lot of weird messages out there. But I just wanted to, with this slide, make the point. We're going to geek out on the nutrients a little bit, but food is more than just nutrients. Um, in the new book, I have this chap chapter six is Eat or Heal Thyself. It's really just sort of asking people to, to take a step back from all of the biases that we've developed about food. Now, I, this molecule just gives me a lot of hope. It's my favorite brain molecule. A lot of people think we're going to do high level concepts, then research studies. Um, and in 19 minutes, <clears throat> they're going to take your questions. I think there's the coolest molecule out there in terms of as we think about brains and how psychotherapy works, how does ECT work, how do medications work. At some point, most of them, especially you know, the newer ones, think about ketamine and psilocybin and all these things, they're, they're spurring brain growth via often BDNF. This is like this just very cool molecule that, that I think it, it, it coaxes new brain cells being born. It's called a new neurotrophin. I'm sure most of you have heard about it, but I, I think about it as putting the brain into brain grow mode, right? Where the brain is in a uh, creative, optimistic, you know, kind of like highest, highest uh, part of our functioning as humans. And there are lots of nutrients that are directly biochemically involved with BDNF. It's not as easy as like, hey, I took my zinc supplement. You can like hear the brain cells growing. I'm, I'm sure nobody on this call thinks that, but you know, some of our patients do get that messaging and that's what they think. But I'll just say there are six or seven nutrients intimately tied with BDNF. And this concept, and I'm sure there's a review for most people on the call, this neuroplasticity, just the idea that our, our brain grows and evolves in, in adult life. And it's kind of new. The reason docs my age get all excited about it, like, you know, mid 40s plus, is that when I finished medical school, we didn't know this happened. They were like, you get 90 billion brain cells, Ramsey, <clears throat> be careful, good luck. And that was it, right? Don't run out. It was very scary. This is like the Nancy Reagan days, very scary. But now we know, hey, you grow new brain cells. There's hope for me. I might not remember that word today, but if I keep working on it, maybe my brain can grow into uh, back into something. We see this in our, with our patients with bad depression, right? You come in and you can tell it's like the brain is not entirely online. And, and then it is. One way to think about that is brain growth. And one of the headwinds to this inflammation, such a buzzword and wellness and medicine. So it's kind of surprising that it's true, but it is true. When you activate peripheral inflammation, those little inflammatory factors float around and then they trigger immune cells in our brain and our brain starts to get a little inflamed. Now our brain doesn't get bruised and bleed and turn purple and get scabs, but when you have activated immune cells, it's not great. You create, immune cells tend to create more kind of reactive oxygen species, right? They're trying to protect themselves. And so if there are ways that we can decrease inflammation, it seems in some of the latest science that really affects a lot of patients. You know, I've seen studies now saying about a third of patients with chronic depression probably are struggling with inflammation. It's a little complicated in the research because we also know when people get depressed and have mental health disorders, particularly depression, though, uh, peripheral inflammatory factors go up. So it's a little, it's one of those things a little tough to sort out, but what's not tough to sort out is where inflammation comes from. And for a lot of people, not everybody, right? We all meet people who are taking great care of themselves. Everything's dialed in, diet, exercise, deep relationship, mantra, the whole nine yards, sleep hygiene, and they're still struggling with their mental health. Um, it's nice to be among professionals. Everybody knows that, right? But some of these things, there's a lot we can do about. I used to ride my bike furiously as a young psychiatrist in Manhattan. And, and right next to the West Side Highway, and it kind of got a little cough, you'd end up and you'd feel like it was like runner's high plus carbon monoxide high because you're like basically sucking on a tailpipe the whole time. I, somebody had told me about that or asked me about that. I started riding in Central Park. It's not like that's the cleanest air, but it did make a big difference, at least felt to me it was. So diet though, besides environmental toxins and some of these things really is at the center, especially if you think about some of these like microbiome problems, um, and chronic stress, diet gets involved, right? What do people do when they stress eat? It's not like, I'll take some more kale, blueberries, and a little wild salmon. Is that what we eat when we're stressed? So uh, thinking about what we can do, and, and, and not to make inflammation and neuroinflammation, all this stuff scary, but to think about it is we're actually living a way that promotes our brain not being its healthiest. So let's kind of unwind that as best we can. Now, one of the new parts of nutritional psychiatry is the microbiome. It, everybody's sort of this, right? These are all of the 
And if you haven't heard of this, I'm really excited to be the first to tell you, I didn't mean that to sound judgmental. The microbiome are all the organisms living in our gut, mostly in our colon. Your body, I don't know this in medical school, it really freaked me out. It's pathology that like every square inch of you is covered in bacteria, like everywhere. And you just sort of like see how the medical students start to like look at their hands, look at each other, but it's true. And if we think about living in synergy with these organisms, medicine, uh, psychiatry, and uh, you know, has a lot to learn, but medicine has really been excited about killing bacteria for the past hundred years. It's like the best thing that we could do early on. And now it's interesting that I, <clears throat> right now I'm going to swill a hundred million bacteria colony forming units here live on the Zoom in front of mental health care professionals and you're not going to hospitalize me, right? You're not going to be like, Ramsey was like <clears throat> drinking bacteria and saying it's good for your health. Like, no, you're going to maybe go get some of this after I tell you how cool it is. And you probably already know how cool it is because the microbiome regulates our immune system, regulates inflammation. Most people have a very not diverse microbiome because it's just been eating all that sort of sugar and uh, not the right fats and not a lot of fiber. And there's a lot of data that if we, again, unwind that, get on more fermented foods and more plants, uh, we'll do a better job in regulating uh, inflammation. A lot of cool new science. We'll go over a couple of studies. All right. Now, this is surprising to a lot of us that there are already dietary recommendations for the prevention of depression published in 2016. And I think it's surprising because none of us really incorporate that. Um, the American Psychiatric Association does not have any recommendations when it comes to food. So, and none of this is surprising. It's essentially saying don't eat processed garbage, eat a more traditional dietary pattern. Um, by the way, again, these are the big players, um, Natalie Parletta, Almuda Sanchez Viegas. I've got a great interview up on Medscape with her from a few years ago, probably four years ago, that's more than a few. Uh, but they came in, we had the ISNPR, the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research in Washington, DC a few years ago. Quickly, again, I'm gonna skip it. Yeah, we did a number on food. My first book, The Happiness Diet is, is kind of all about this. Just we went from whole food to processed food. And in detail, if you think about what that does for the brain, you just stop eating a lot of the nutrients that people really need. And then you add stuff, right? We added in food dyes and preservatives and trans fats. And, you know, people can argue all day long about how much of a health effect that has. I just think like, I don't know. It had, we didn't need it in the past for a lot of human love, a lot of human smiles and creativity. And again, I think about this thing is like, I don't know, depends what's analogy. It's either race car, or, race car or thoroughbred horse, depending on which mood I'm in, because I'm such a little boy. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 you don't want to give it like garbage. You want to give it the best fuel. And anyway, this whole promise like, hey, eat processed food, take your multivitamin, all's good. Not so much, right? This is the 2009 data because the more current data is just more depressing. But look at these, like folate. We all know there's a like key vitamin B9, key for brain cells. Three quarters of Americans don't get enough. Vitamin E, the new data is 96%. Right? It's a fat soluble antioxidant vitamin, just sits in your brain and protects it. Highly correlated with depression risk. Nobody eats any vitamin E. And what I also learned early on is that none of us know where to find it. Doctors don't, patients don't, therapists don't, they don't talk about it, right? Vitamin E, you don't find a lot of places. And what I learned in my last book, Eat Complete, was really this notion of there being some specialized molecules out there and let's revolve our eating around those. Vitamin E, by the way, is olive oil, almonds, avocados. <clears throat> this is just to show you how much sugar we eat. Every, you know, and, and I think a lot of times, especially when people are in a healthier mode, they might not see these uh, or see uh, um, where these are creeping into their diet. But as you can see, we just started eating a lot of empty calories and sugar. And we started eating a lot of empty calories and oils, right? Look at all the soybean oil. Now, I'm not saying soybean oil is a smoking gun here, but it's just to note that we really shifted the types of fats that we eat. And by doing that, we shift the types of fats that our cells are made up of. So the idea here is that as you increase more omega-6 fatty at intake, this isn't a proven theory, but it's an interesting idea, via vegetable fats, you're kind of uh, rigging or tilting cells towards a more inflammatory response, right? Instead of responding with a community police officer to like, these police, this actually isn't a good analogy anymore. Sorry, instead of, uh, I'm gonna move on. Uh, so the idea here is uh, omega-6 to uh, omega-3 fat ratio. 
which is like one to 10 in Paleolithic population. So again, as you load up on more of these oils, you're, you're, you're crowding out omega-3 fats for more omega-6 fats. These fats tend to compete for enzymes when there is an inflammatory response. So uh, it's a very interesting notion of how dietary change at kind of a deep cellular level might lead to stuff like this. So let's go into some of the studies now. First, we're going to hit the epidemiological studies. Everybody likes to say, I'm going to say it, correlation doesn't equal causation, which means these studies like this, you know, don't prove anything. Well, that's true. But when we look at correlational studies, we want one that looks at a lot of people over a long period of time. So this looks at university students in Spain, follows over 10,000 of them over four and a half years, prospective epidemiological study. And I like that. It looks at their Mediterranean dietary adherence score. This is the top half of the college, right? top best Mediterranean, top half Mediterranean diet. And look at the reduction in depression. So one means like no change. And then as you eat more Mediterranean-ness, there's more Mediterranean-ness to your diet, the decreased depression, right? This is a 50% reduction in the risk of depression over four and a half years. Now, anybody with a kid, um, who would take that? I certainly would when I send the little bub off to college. How can we do this? Can we do this? Are there any trials to show that we can reduce college depression with food? Well, let's get to those in a second. But first, when we put all the correlational studies together, we get an 18.2% reduction in the risk of, of depression in a population that eats a more traditional diet. So these are all kind of below one here. You decrease the risk of depression. Right? And as I, I think that reason I showed you the farm boy slide, like I, I like math, okay. But when I look at this, it's like farm boy says reduces the risk of depression. Correlation doesn't equal causation, so we need to prove this with randomized trials. Felice Jack is really the, the legendary, she's a legend in this field, in the nutritional psychiatry. She's in most of the great research, and this uh, is the big first trial, and it's 2017. That's how long it took until anybody studied using nutrition to treat clinical depression. They augmented uh, depression treatment as usual. Most folks in this trial were in some sort of talk therapy or getting an antidepressant, you know, to standard patient who has response, doing okay, engaged, feeling better, but doesn't have full remission. They taught them the Mediterranean diet in 12, over 12 weeks and seven individual nutritional sessions. 67 people were in the trial, 33 people get the intervention, and a third of them go into full remission compared to two in the control group. So that's the number needed to treat a 4.1, which for those of you who know those kind of stats, I mean, that's just a very powerful number in medicine. If you compare this, right, adding on Abilify, Aripriprazole, a second generation antipsychotic to an SSRI, and compare it to adding on uh, the Mediterranean diet, Abilify costs, used to cost about $1,000 a month, comes with all kinds of side effects, nice medicine when it works. Uh, all right, compare that to, and the number needed to treat, sorry, is 10. Mediterranean diet saved patients $140 a month in this study, right? No side effects. Side effects like, it's delicious, doctor, thank you. That sounds great. Another side effect, hey, people tend to get into a more um, healthy state on traditional diets. Um, and the number needed to treat is 4.1. All right, so this followed up later that year, the Healthy Med trial. This was taking that same intervention, but uh, teaching people in groups. If you're in a mental health setting where you can do a cooking group, cooking class, if you want to tune into our free cooking class, we have one coming up June the 20th, a fundraiser for Hilarity to Charity. We do a free cooking class at least every quarter. We have two this month. Um, just a great, great way to engage. Um, this is actually where I started doing food work was in community mental health. So any of you in community mental health, uh, you probably already do this and know. Just really a nice way to get people engaged uh, and, and, and active <clears throat> and also model it. We've done some interventions at hospital systems. And when you teach people about the food, but also if we were having lunch together right now and everybody was getting some lentils and some quinoa and a little wild salmon, it, it just kind of helps. A lot of these foods people haven't tried before. All right, so this trial, more people, 152 folks, notice these uh, DASH scores. It is really, really depressed patients. This isn't like, I'm a little down, should I eat some more dark chocolate? This is like suicidally, severely, extremely depressed. Over three months, those folks, in addition to treatment as usual, get this cooking workshop. 
I think that would be very good for my mood, right? What are you doing tonight? Oh, well, it's Tuesday night, babe. You know, I've got my every fortnight Mediterranean style cooking class. We're going to have an olive oil tasting today with me and all of my friends. I'd love that. So 45% imp uh, improvement uh, compared to a social group. Uh, and those changes sustained at six months. So the idea that you can add in uh, diet and help patients, uh, just to show this, the mood food trial, not all these trials are positive. This was a complicated trial. They took a thousand patients, split them up into four different groups where people got a placebo with therapy, placebo without therapy. They got supplement with and without therapy. The therapy was the nutritional therapy. And they're trying to prevent depression in overweight patients, many of whom had type two, uh, um, I'm sorry, had... Um, uh, adult onset diabetes uh, type two. So, you know, I, you can usually reverse that or often with diet and none of these prevented depression. So uh, just to note, not everything is positive. And we did have that question about those college freshmen. Remember the ones who reduced the risk of depression? But what if somebody did a randomized trial? Well, that's exactly what Heather Francis did in Australia. She went into a psychology class, she and the researchers, and they found depressed college freshmen with poor eating habits. They showed them a 13 minute video, gave them a little box of food, olive oil, nuts, nut butter, the spices, cinnamon, and turmeric. And uh, I'll say that dorm room smelled delicious, right? Um, and some encouragement. They got a phone call like one week after they got the box saying like, hey, Drew, how's it going? You making vegetables? How's the cinnamon? Are you using the olive oil? And then they got a second call. Just two five minute phone calls and a 13 minute video about kind of like why to eat for mental health and eat a more Mediterranean diet and a lot of free resources. They found not only the kids change how they ate, but their stress and well here, I mean, that's three weeks. Imagine, do you see any other intervention that, that, you know, teens will adopt that drops their mood rating scale in three weeks like that? I mean, that's better than antidepressant. So it's just really exciting to see this. You think, well, it needs to be replicated. Last month it was replicated. So I'm not trying to say food's the only thing, but when we think about engaging with teens, right? The idea is, oh, they don't change what they eat. That's not true. Two randomized trials have shown that. Oh, they're depressed. They can't change what they eat. Not true. Five trials have now shown people with depression can easily adopt this. So anyway, how does this work? Who knows, you know? These are the nine mechanisms I think that are involved. Hey, that maybe some folks are getting the ex that extra folate they need because they're now eating leafy greens because no one ever like taught them how to. Um, um, maybe it's more BDNF and less inflammation and a healthy microbiome. Maybe it's all these yummy plants. Um, maybe we're getting rid of all those toxic diets. Who knows? The food SIBO, right? That I say brain food, wild salmon, arugula, right? And if you start eating those and you start feeling better, there's a little food SIBO effect. That's why vegans and carnivores both report that it's like the most amazing diet for their mental health is because they cut out processed food and there's a big food SIBO effect. Connection and community, just if you're not connected up to your food community, you're struggling uh, with your mental health clinicians, great way to connect up with people and, 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 and talk and share. And then empowerment, there's a lot we tell patients that's hard, like go to psychotherapy, talk about hard stuff, process trauma, right? Take a medicine that maybe you, you have stigma or bias against. Food's pretty empowering, right? It's like, hey, you can do this. You can take care of yourself. You can really, uh, you know, have some discipline around this and, and notice a difference. So we've tried to take this to the clinic by saying we have, I have a, a really small but wonderful group of clinicians, Samantha L. Kreef, uh, Emily Berner, our coach, Dr. Shao Jehu, and uh, and uh, Eve Kavik, who's uh, joining our group. Um, and and, and uh, mostly with Samantha, we've tried to teach clinicians about this, but also apply it. My first book, when it came out, it's really since, I don't know, probably about 2008, I've just taken a food history on every single patient I've met. What like, and it's just fascinating. I met this woman today or last week, a college student. She doesn't eat anything until 1 p.m. when she eats chicken breast. You know, it's like really interesting, easy to judge, but mostly interesting. Like, what's that about? Where'd that come from? Is that really what works for her? So these are some of the big concepts, though, because we're going to go through uh, um, some quick how we do it in the clinic, and then I'm going to take your questions. So we try to ask this, like, what's a brain food, right? Focus on nutrient density. People focus on calories. Calories are a useless number unless you're counting nutrients, right? Like cup, uh, can of Coke, kale salad, they both have 140 calories, right? One's obviously filled with nutrition. One's filled with carbonated, sugary, tasty, but empty calories. And then can we kind of focus and inspire people with neuroplasticity just to say, I'm all about food. Some people tell you about this supplement, that supplement. I'm just like, yeah, 
you know, everything you put in your mouth, the body has to process. So there's a lot of hype about supplements and I don't think much data other than they increase the risk of death. Um, the women's health study, if you want to see that study. So this is when we talk to clinicians, you know, one is just to start doing this work, just being curious, right? You're an eater, your patients are eaters, kind of like the pandemic is something that we have in common with patients. So it makes it a little bit more fun, I think, and, and kind of, I don't know, spontaneous. <clears throat> trying to establish quickly by walking somebody through a day in their life. Hey, tell me about what you eat. Walk me through your day. One, I'm just looking at as any mental health clinicians, as people organize that, what do they say, right? Are they a calorie counter? Are they adhering to a diet? If so, where did they learn about it? And to really try and seem non-judgmental because most of us in healthcare seem pretty judgmental when it comes to food, right? You tell a doctor, you just went on keto, like 90% of them are like, <clears throat> Right. And it's like, I don't know, we're mental health clinicians, right? That's what makes us special talking about food. Instead of having that, I just had a patient who went on keto, is now taking 60 milligrams of Adderall out of nowhere, prescribed from somebody who's not monitoring it, but she also lost 45 pounds, you know? So I really tried to sit there and not be biased in my assessment of that. Um, I'm trying to avoid diet dogma on clinicians, right? I, it, it's not our job, in my opinion, to tell people to go keto or go carnivore, to go vegan or to go plant-based. There's no data that supports that. It, it is our job, I think, based on the evidence to assess diet and let patients know there are things that they can do and, and ways that you as an expert can help them. But I just, uh, there are a lot of people who have, you know, the way to mental health is go vegan or go carnivore. And I just think that's really, I think it's disrespectful to the data and to our patients. It's not what they need. I'm looking for these high yield food and food categories. I'm, I, you know, I wasn't trained in nutrition. So what's really helped me is, I'll show you in a minute, we started thinking in food categories, right? It's not about kale. It's about leafy greens. And then just, I started thinking about motivations. Where is it? Most people are motivated about weight, right? Or about maybe their diagnosis or med side effects or feelings, um, uh, all right, so talking to people, this is what I heard, right? People often say, I eat a pretty healthy diet, doc. I count calories, avoid this stuff. I drink lots of red wine to protect my brain. And I said, like, first of all, that doesn't really fill your plate. It doesn't really tell us anything about you other than you drink too much, right? And, and, and there's some, I don't know, no red meat self-righteousness, which is kind of, I don't know. If you're working with anybody who is lower SES, show me a better value, more satiating, higher iron, better protein food than ground beef. I mean, it, it's just, you know, if you have a hungry family. Um, anyway, um, I started talking to patients about what they eat, and this is what I heard. I had a, a patient, smartphones came out, that's how old I am. And so I had a patient take a picture of everything he ate. Um, and if you look at this, right, you're mostly seeing one molecule, you're mostly seeing glucose, right? The pizza, the pasta, the bread, the bun, the bagel, the potatoes. The, uh, and you're not seeing vegetables, right? You're not seeing seafood. You're not seeing a lot of our favorite food categories for mental health. So we try when we think about eating to beat depression, think in terms of simple swaps. It's not that you can't ever eat a French fry again. That would be a crime. But like, I don't know, oven baked potato fries, or if you follow my Instagram, you see there's a lot of oven baked potatoes in there because they're delicious. They cool down their resistant starch, right? I like a nice grass fed beef burger, yummy. But when was the last time you had a salmon burger? Most of us will put down a lot of burgers a year, right? If you have a burger a week, maybe two, right? That's like a hundred hamburgers a year. What if 25% of those were fish burgers? And you know, that would just be great for your brain if you like salmon burgers and you should try the recipe and eat to be depression and anxiety. If you haven't tried one, it's with canned salmon, really high value. Even my daughter, oh, I'm gonna get sad again. My daughter who just left for summer camp, even she likes them. We could all agree these are the nutrients. Anybody who's looked at this world, right? These are the nutrients, some of them we cared about. But I was wondering, being, I was at Columbia, I'm still at Columbia, but I was like younger and more worried and anxious. And I was like, man, if I start telling people what to eat as a psychiatrist, people are going to wonder why we pick these foods. Like, why blueberries? And so Laura Lachance, who was a, also a young psychiatrist at the time, um, uh, we uh, started to sound so ageist today. <clears throat> um, it's like, anyway. Um, we said, what foods have, what nutrients, we asked two questions, what nutrients have uh, significant data that they're involved in the prevention and treatment of depression? We found 12. And what are the foods that have the most of those? This is the antidepressant food scale. It's published in the Journal World, World Journal, Psych, Journal of World Psychiatry. Um, and these are the 12 nutrients. And we just asked 
per calorie, right? Again, a lot of these food profiling systems like the ANDI, the Aggregate Nutrient Density Index, they're looking at new, all of the nutrients, but also they want to, you know, they're going to ding foods if they have salt or saturated fat. We didn't look at any processed foods and we just wanted to know per calorie what gives us the most of these. So uh, this is what we found. And again, it proves the point of these food categories, right? If you want the top 10 plant foods, you should be picking some leafy greens, wouldn't you say? Because that's what the top 10, actually probably like the top 12, right? And if you can see cruciferous vegetables, right? Uh, leafy greens, and then some, some what we call rainbow vegetables. It's kind of not that these are the only 20, but, but uh, um, over here on the animal food, most of the nutrient density scales don't even have animals on them because the animal foods, proteins tend to have a little bit higher calories because of the fat content. And also there are lots of plants we think about, like where's my almonds and, and cashews and all those nuts that are amazing. They're not on the list. So, you know, to make the point, these aren't the only foods, but they're starting to kind of teach us principles. If you're really after B12, omega-3 fats, zinc, iodine, selenium, a complete protein, and you like bivalves, mussels, clams, and oysters, incredible value. And we begin to think about things like you know, the small fish uh, like anchovies or, or, or herring or sardines. Um, uh, these are the foods that have the most of these nutrients. So we've really tried work to kind of create a bunch of resources and e-courses just to help people be more educated as, as brain foodies, I call them. Uh, how to seek out these high yield foods like high iron foods here. Uh, liver is at the top, which no one eats, but you mix a little bit of liver in with your uh, uh, ground beef and, and some taco seasoning, not too much, you know, but you, you'll supercharge it with B vitamins. Um, clams, you know, not only great, clams are the top source of B12. Everybody loves B12 injections, but I don't hear enough about pasta Mongolia. Some people are like, oh yeah, no, I take my history. And they're like, don't worry, doc, I get a B12 injection every month. And I was like, I eat pasta Mongolia whenever I can. Um, pumpkin seeds, real sleeper vegetable here and cashews, just lots and lots of iron for a plant-based food and dark chocolate. Again, I don't drop that cacao powder in my smoothie, uh, just because I don't know, I want to sell books, uh, with dark chocolate. It's because I love it. And it's great for the brain, more blood flow to the brain, protective. It seems for depression, very activating. So unless you have bad anxiety from theobromines, which puts it, uh, which are those stimulating compounds, I think high quality, solid dark chocolate is great. There's even some data that, uh, high quality, uh, this was a concentrate of the flavanols, uh, so you have to eat a lot of dark chocolate to get that much, but these flavanols seem to reverse age-related memory decline. All right, I'm going to get to, yikes, your questions here. Let's just quickly go through the food categories. People ask a lot about seafood, you know, uh, where the human brain evolved, we say it's the grasslands of Africa. Actually, back then when the human brain evolved, it was a shoreline. And so that's where we have some idea, evolutionary biologists think, all these minerals and omega-3 fats, that the human brain kind of evolved eating these things. And oysters really prove nutrient density. You don't have to always eat oysters, but you know, look at this. Six oysters is just 60 calories for medium-sized East Coast oysters. And look at all the nutrition you get for that. Just incredible. And just again, those omega-3 fats, they actually go into the cell. They sit in the cell membrane, right? Right here. And when there's more omega-3 fats, there's some research that these pumps are a little more efficient, right? Uh, omega-3 fats are one of the things that induce BDNF that, that uh, miracle growth of the brain. And there's even some data that more omega-3 fats in the cell walls lead to better synaptic transmission. All these, what's a perfect fish? And these are the ones I like to think about. We're avoiding mercury because we're getting young, small fish, right? And particularly thinking about expanding, right? I love wild salmon, but I want to expand into sardines and anchovies and rainbow trout because you want a diverse type of fish in your diet, in my opinion. And everyone talks about cost, really important to talk about both for ourselves and our patient. Inflation has made all this stuff ridiculously expensive. Uh, this is like a million years ago, but it was in Whole Foods in, in New York, in Manhattan. Just to make the point, you know, you can for 10 to 20 bucks, get a pound of wild salmon frozen. Get it frozen. That's it. most of all of it is frozen. So if you're getting fresh, it's just been defrosted and use canned. We have a great resources on my website, Brain Food on a Budget. It's a free PDF 
Um, it's on the uh, depression and anxiety section of my blog. Um, it's a nice colorful PDF that, that you or your patients are welcome to use to go over all the main foods and the costs. This is Rocket Pie again, illustrating that point. I love beef burgers, but what about a Sam burger? I love cheese pizza. I just had cheese pizza last night. But there's lots of vegetables on my pizza. There's lots of microgreens usually on my pizza. Actually, we threw a, like a pizza birthday party for our kids and people thought we were weird because we like, like sprinkled arugula on top of the pizza because I am a little strange maybe. But this is also that the meat on there is clams. This is garlic and, and canned clams that are chopped up, right? And each slice of this pizza has over 200% of your daily need of vitamin B12. This is my spiritual home. As I told you, my daughter left for summer camp just hours ago. So I bring up this photo. I put on the headphones. I have this ASMR video of people like chopping kale. This is the largest kale field. I'm just teasing there. I'm, I'm okay. I might do some of that, to be honest. This is the largest kale field in America. So if you've ever had Cal Organics kale, uh, this is where it came from, which is kind of cool. I don't, like I said, I tried to take money from big kale, but again, we had through some big kale parties. What's interesting just about food in general, right? All stuff to learn this right here, this big, well, what's that? Well, that's actually the healthiest green in the field right there. That's purslane. If you have a garden, it's this kind of a, looks like a little succulent. You can grill it, chop it up, put it in your salads raw. But this is also, this is lacinato kale. This is the best kale. This is what you should make your kale Caesar salads out of, in my opinion, and not kale chips. We could talk kale all the time. This is the first scientific study. It's actually why I'm uh, reasonably famous and well-known as I'm sure you all know the <clears throat> first landmark Yale kale trial, uh, being a young psychiatrist in New York, I noticed all of my colleagues who went to Yale were so depressed. I mean, like worse. And so I sent some kale seeds in these t-shirts up to Yale, Look what happened. I'm sure you saw the write-up of this trial. It was amazing, amazing science, amazing science. In all seriousness, kale did teach me that brain food tends to have a few qualities. It's nutrient dense, which we've talked about. It's versatile in the kitchen. You come see me, we're gonna have kale salad or kale smoothies or kale cocktails or non-liquid versions of kale, like kale chips, or I like it braised these days, or an all-kale Caesar. And it's gonna be locally available. I can't get anchovies here most places. You can't, right, if you're not by the sea, but a lot of foods you can get locally, especially all the plants. And we found clinically, this is where our coaches and, and we have a couple of chefs on our team. It's really helpful, right? Like when I see more leafy greens, you didn't think pesto with gnocchi, did you? But that's what I meant. That's what I'm having today for my leafy greens, because there's so much kale and basil in my pesto. Uh, now uh, we're going to burn through some food categories and I'll let you go. Almonds, uh, just to say, uh, we tell patients almonds or tell people nuts, they get worried about the calories. It's like a little packet of olive oil. Everybody agrees olive oil is good for you. Also, the uh, USDA issued a statement that 25% of the calories are overestimated in nuts. So take 25% off. Um, lentils and beans, they've gotten a bad rap. There's all this stuff about lectins. There's no problems at all ever in humans eating cooked beans and lentils. That is just a marketing campaign that has somehow gotten a lot of traction. If you eat raw lentils, a very small percentage of people can have some, uh, what's called hemolysis, blood cells, uh, actually lice break. Most people don't get that. And again, don't eat undercooked lentils and beans. But I think you knew that before this call. This is French onion soup from Eat Complete, which is a nutritional psychiatry cookbook I wrote. And we just dumped in a can of white beans and just made it, you know, went from just being like French onion soup with no nutrition to like yummy. Eat Your Rainbows, great public health campaign. These are the smoothies from Eat Complete, a pumpkin, a kiwi spinach, and a wild blueberry. We have these different colors. You want to look at your plate. Easy, easy. Thing. Just look at your plate. Are there colors? If you're eating the beige diet, reach it. Grab some microgreens. Chop up a red pepper. Do something because you want to see three or four natural colors on there. Red cabbage is one of my sleeper vegetables, roasted in olive oil and garlic. Yum, yum, yum. Uh, but the reason is those different colors represent different pigment molecules. Also, those are the phytonutrients. When we talk about, usually people say they're antioxidants. You know, they're much more powerful. You look at what quercetin does or what, what um, uh, genistin does, right? That's a, these isoflavones have all these estrogen activities. These flavanols are actually correlated with uh, cognitive protection. So really interesting. There's like 7,000 flavonoids. Really interesting family of molecules. Just quick thing, right? Different rainbow colors equal different phytonutrients. But since you're clinicians, I'm obligated by the FDA to give you this warning. <clears throat> While 
plants and colorful plants may have many health benefits yet unproven by science, we must always talk about the risks. And so if you prescribe more rainbow plants to patients, you just got to warn them. First of all, it starts as like a little tingling in the fingers and it freaks them out if you haven't told them about it. Then you feel tingling in your heart. You feel a sense of love and warmth and you want to share that with other people. And then the rainbow comes out your finger. So warn them, but also tell them like until this happens, you're not eating enough colorful plants. All right, fermented foods. Now I'm eating six servings of these a day because I love the study from Stanford and I never do this. I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, there's a new study, now I'm gonna change my routine. I do get to drink a lot more kombucha, which I like. Fermented foods have always been around. That's how we stirred food, stored food and preserved it. This is a study I'm talking about. They basically took mostly women and they gave them fermented foods versus more plants. And what they found is when you give people more plants, actually people had a little bit more inflammation and their, their immune status, their immune system didn't really change that much. They got better at digesting plants. When you give people more fermented foods, they have a little bloating for a few weeks and then their microbiome is incredibly diverse and they actually decrease and change inflammatory um, activity, excuse me. So really, really cool studies, but they, they bumped them from 0.4 servings a day to six servings a day. So I don't get six, but I try and get multiple fermented foods every day. There's really cool studies. This study on mania, if you're in the bipolar world, definitely check out. Uh, it's a bipolar disorder. It was a pure randomized placebo. A treatment as usual for acute mania, placebo versus probiotic added onto treatment as usual. What they found is they decreased the rehospitalization rate by 90% over six months with the probiotic in patients that had this high inflammatory index. Isn't that super cool? Um, so everyone, I'm gonna ask you to take your questions. I don't have a lot of time. Oh my gosh, I'm out of time, it's horrible. I'll stay on and take questions. I'm so sorry to run long. You had me waxing on here. Um, I hope in addition to my pharmacy with all the medicines that psychiatrists love, there's also the farm pharmacy. I hope these make more sense. We didn't talk about enough kefir, but that's my favorite fermented food besides the kombucha. Um, and I hope it makes sense why these are on a list as you think about eating for mental health. If you like this info, please join us. We're the Brain Foodies. We have the Mental Fitness Kitchen, our free uh, cooking class. Um, uh, it was featured in the Times earlier this year. We had, I think we had over a thousand people in our last class. Super cool. Friday Feels is our, our, our newsletter. It's just of links of usually five, six, seven links of uh, some of our content, but just things that interest us that are going on on the internet. And then we've got these free downloads, as I mentioned. And so I hope it all, uh, all this info also helps you think about eating to build a better brain. I hope these concepts are interesting and, and useful to you in your clinical work, but also with your own brain and your family. Remember the basic message here, probably not shocking, moving towards a more traditional dietary pattern in the data is protective for depression, probably also for anxiety and maybe ADHD, certainly for dementia. And helping patients navigate this is a really wonderful thing we can do as mental health professionals. This is my most recent book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety. I hope this helps you feed your mental health, everybody. I'm easy to find. Our team is, is here to help in any way. We have our new Healing the Modern Brain course coming out, gosh, in like a week. And then for you all, there's the clinician training and there's a link through Triad, I think with a, a discount. So please check that out. And then I'm mostly on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, DM me, follow me, you know, feed my fragile ego. And, and any of you have expertise in middle-aged men, whose lovely tween daughters just went to summer camp. Gosh, definitely DM me. All right, I'm going to go take some questions now. So sorry to go long, everyone. Thanks for your time and attention. All right, here we go. Oh, you're all just nice, nice things. Good luck with your daughter. It'll be okay. Feelings are healthy, daddy. These are nice mom teeth. All right. Um, picky eaters, particularly children. Yeah, I think for picky eaters, one of the things that happens is all these superfoods that are hard for kids like kale and broccoli. My feeling in my experience, I've got an 11 year old and eight year old eater and they love sugar and carbs like all children. One reason that kids love sweets and we want to kind of modulate, not give them big doses of lots and lots of super saturated, but you know, whatever dessert they like, I think is, is great for kids. The reason is they're eating all those calories because they're growing a femur. 
And everybody on this call, none of you grew a femur last night. None of you made bone cells, right? Maybe a few of you did if you broke something. But so, uh, you know, that's why kids crave carbs. And is there, it signals to the brain, hey, these are self calories. Let's, let's grow some femur. For picky eaters, you know, I'm really, I get curious on what it is. Is it taste? Is it textures? Is it health foods? I've met a lot of moms uh, over the years doing this where they come in because of their picky eater. And I do a list of like vegetables. And, you know, after I get to like 20, I'm like, and I remember here, here I was like, you're, I heard from my mom, but I was sitting with her and son, I was like, I'm not sure what to say. I want to say this respectfully, but like your son eats curry and vegetable curry. Like you gotta like get to the, you know, there's other, it's like, that's not picky. So, but that's not true. Lots of people have uh, taste textures. I just think partnering with kids, trying not to make it a battle. Um, we, we uh, our health coach and chef Emily Burner works with some families just to kind of help with meal prep, help with stress, help finding common ground, um, uh, figuring out, you know, where the upgrades are. If your kid only eats burger and fries, can that be grass fed beef and oven roasted potatoes at home? It's a lot better. Can, you know, you put a lot of avocado and other veggies on that. Okay. Avocado burger, you know, with uh, some uh, oven roasted potatoes with olive oil, uh, you know, that, that, that's not what's causing our health problem with our kids. Um, I think fish is really challenging for kids. Thanks for putting the website up there, everybody. I hope it's even easy to navigate. Um, my thoughts on neurotoxin from organic versus organic, non-organic. That's a really great question. So, you know, what the biggest meta-analysis and actually that fermented food study, uh, Christopher Gardner is the lead author. He's a Stanford physician and just like big thinker. He was the lead author on the meta or the senior author on the meta-analysis that came out, I don't say five years ago, that looked at all of the data and basically said, there's no health outcome differences that can be detected if you pool all of the organic versus non-organic, but it trends towards organic food having people eat more of it having better health outcomes. There's a study of elementary school kids that struck me uh, where they took the kids, they took their pee, they found lots of pesticide residues because you just find that that's, you know, it's on vegetables, we digest it and, and process it and pee it out. They put the kids on organic food, took levels two weeks later, there is no pesticide residues. So pesticides are neurotoxins, you know, uh, most of them fade in the environment. I think that coming from a farming part of the world. I think farming where our food comes from is really misunderstood. And so farmers get a lot of flack, but um, I try to go organic whenever I can. But also, as I said, there are a lot of families who can't afford that. I want you eating frozen broccoli, right? Because it's the cheapest way. And if it's frozen non-organic broccoli and you can stock up on it, know you have broccoli for a month, and that gives you food security, broccoli food security, I'm 100% for that. If you can't afford organic beef, great. If you, you know, you should be looking for grass fed, not organic. Um, sorry to be talking about beef so much. Uh, I don't know why that is uh, today. Um, let's see, what well, do nutrient dense food make up for the potential exposure? So the toxins, the glycophosphate, which is Roundup and, and the factory farming or big farming, you know, I, I think those exposure and the, and the sort of toxicity of it has been, I wouldn't say overblown, but you know, the main thing to do as eaters for us is to move away from, from the things that really are the low hanging fruit for, for us and our patients, right? So that tends to be processed food. I mean, a lot of people who are anti-GMO and they're eating a vegan diet, and they're eating a lot of candy bars and processed foods, you know, that are that are built healthy. I'm not saying that this is you, um, uh, whoever is asking. That. It's a great question. I, I care a lot about the glycophosphate and Roundup. One of one of the ideas is that that type of farming, right? We're going to kill everything, make the earth pretty sterile, right? We're going to then put in NPK. We're going to fertilize, and then we're going to put in our seeds, and we're going to irrigate you know, that's really costing us that we're losing topsoil in that way because you're always tilling. Um, it, it kills everything, right? Herbicides and pesticides, they kill everything. So we're losing all the diversity. The soil, instead of being rich and alive, right? Like, like when you buy that organic uh, kale, you, you're, you're buying the bacteria that are also on it. You can't wash that off. So uh, I think it's a good question. My sense is um, nutrient dense foods make up for all of our exposures as much as they can, because the main exposure that we have right now, day in, day out is toxic food. Right? I mean, that that's the, no matter what, you know, whether it's, you know, and, and I use that word lightly, but uh, I'm guilty of it too, right? Daughter is going away, as I said, about 90 times this call, right? We had big ice cream last night to celebrate, right? As much as I don't want food to be a celebration, you know, think about all the foods that we celebrate things with, cakes, pies, ice cream, you know, so 
uh, yeah, that, that's all right. Balance concern mercury contamination was feed the fish need to obtain their that. The question is about mercury contamination. So I stood up in front of this conference five years ago. Alan Logan is in the audience. He's one of the world experts in omega-3 fats and mood disorders. And I talk about fish and mercury and say, like, I showed him the slide I showed you guys, a little more updated now, but you know, hey, here's the fish. And he's he said, Dr. Ramsey, and he's a like one of those health officer, like public health service, who's so like in full uniform. He's like, Will you raise your right hand? And will you promise me you'll never use the word mercury in a public educational forum? And then he explained that everyone's concerned about mercury, right? The average American eats 14 pounds of fish a year. If you, and we all know that story of the young kid who ate tuna every day and then got mercury poisoning. So it's a real thing, but the big problem is not eating mercury, right? Most small fish like anchovies and sardines are low in mercury. You as a person get mercury exposure all the time, right? You get it from all kinds of things. Uh, so you wanna avoid shark, tile fish, swordfish and Atlantic mackerel. Those are the four that have the most mercury and, and mainly focus on younger, smaller fish and the bivalves. That's my sense of how you don't have to worry about mercury. Um, that's a great question though. And uh, thanks for putting my Instagram on there after my heart. Um, oh boy, lots of information, people doing intermittent fasting. Don't you love it? Cause like every, I mean, I think, five, 10 years ago, you know, we'd almost call it like an orthorexia, right? If patients came in there like every morning, I don't eat breakfast and then I'm fine. I'm totally fine. And then I, then I have um, like an avocado and then I wait and then I eat a big meal at dinner. It, it's so intermittent fasting or, or fasting mimicking diets or diets where you reduce caloric intake either by eating in an eating window, really helpful for some patients who are really just struggling with boundaries be like, look, is it after four and before nine? Okay, if not, don't eat, right? So all kinds of different ways to do that. Also all kinds of ways for people to develop orthorexia, which is kind of, if you don't know, it's, it's like a eating disorder that's built around nutrition rules, right? If I go to your house and I can't eat anything because you don't have my organic kale and you don't have my special kombucha and oh, you have filtered kombucha, you know, that's orthorexia. I'm not eating because of my food, extreme food rolls. Um, but Anyway, this uh, intermittent fasting, the idea is that we're trying to minimize carbohydrate load. We're trying to get people to have a little bit more ketones going floating around. Ketones are where you break down fat and you feed the brain with these beta hydroxybutyrate, these little breakdown products of fat. It's supposed to be maybe a little more efficient for the brain. Um, and so I like intermittent fasting as a way for people to get a healthy relationship with hunger. Right? We, we um, we really get hooked, I, I do, on snacking, eating, nibbling, nibbling away our stress um, in a way that, that uh, you know, I think we all should examine. Um, yeah, so LMFT, there's folks telling about the agency not to talk about nutrition as an LMFT considered not scope of practice. So, you know, I would just, I appreciate that. I think scope of practice is an important consideration. I get this a lot because I'm a physician, I guess, even though we get no training in nutrition, people allow me to talk about whatever I want. That's a little bit nutty, right? I would say that for based on the data now, um, Steph, that you know, I challenge the agency that I would say any mental health agency that isn't offering some nutrition programming or counseling isn't in line with the evidence. Like you don't want to prevent depression, dementia, and anxiety in your patient population. So uh, one way uh, to tell them uh, that you have gotten a scope of practice, and I don't mean to plug the course, it's just we're really the only course now. We have a 10.25 hour um, uh, course uh, uh, for clinicians about all this that would at least give you maybe a framework and, and some way to think about it. But I appreciate it. You know, uh, applying the information of practice, the scope of issue, you're not a registered dietitian, right? It's the different, it's like a coach. A coach can't say a recommendation, but our coaches, uh, Emily Berner, you know, she's talking about food categories, right? What about assessing a diet and asking a patient, hey, how do you think that, that food and your mental health are related? That's not in your scope of practice. You ask about exercise, right? You're not an exercise physiologist or certified trainer, right? You ask about sleep hygiene, don't you? You're not a certified sleep therapist, are you? You haven't done a sleep. So I just think there's a way you can take that same idea. And yeah, you shouldn't tell people to be a vegan or carnivore. 
you shouldn't tell people that food is the only thing for their mental health. I don't think anybody on this call would, but I do think you should assess people's lifestyle factors because it's most one of the most important factors and how they're taking care of their mental health. And also it's a headwind. It's already going on about this. It just frustrates me, right? You're working on a couple, right? And they're fighting a lot. You think food could be a tool to kind of help them get organized, get on the same page, be productive, make a casserole together? Definitely, definitely. You think in doing that and feeding the kids nutritious food, it helps everybody feel better? Definitely. So I think this idea that it's not scope of practice, I think that's outdated. I'm happy to, to be in debate. As you can tell, it gets me all fired up because I just think it's, it's kind of, I just think it's taking a biological intervention and not using it. Like, why, why wouldn't you feed your patients brain food and do it in that way that we know how to? Like, we're better at talking about food than a lot of people because we're not judgmental in mental health. We say things like, huh, like, it sounds like the grocery store is really hard. Like, maybe with something we could talk about and sort of, I don't know, think about organizing. Like, what kind of foods are you looking for? Huh. That feels in scope of practice. You're all great at that. It's motivation, organization, self-care, self-empowerment. I mean, this is the bread and butter of what we do as mental health clinicians in my mind. So, all right, boy, that's like a big, long-winded answer. Uh, Stevia, I don't like anything that's sweet that doesn't have calories because nothing really. Stevia is natural, right? It's a leaf, so grow stevia plant. I did. I just... I don't really, uh, any out of the, you know, a lot of people, if you're really trying for weight loss, there's, you know, going to a Diet Coke versus a regular Coke, that's a good step in the right direction for a, a lot of weight loss folks would say. Um, and if you really need sweet stuff, stevia is calorie free. It's just anytime you eat sweet, your pancreas squirts out a little, little insulin. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So, oh, Jennifer Jess, incorporating more brain food into our campus dining halls. That would be awesome. It's like, it was my dream uh, to like make a brain food certified like college campus thing where we did like little. Uh, so the thing I recommend is <clears throat> first of all, that schools is partnering first with the people who cook the food, right? Because they have folks telling them all the time and depending on what kind of school you are, there's all kinds of federal guidelines. And so what gets frustrating for these folks, not that you do it this way, but just a lot of people have goodwill and uh, we changed a hospital system in Indianapolis, um, we being the Center for Mind Body Medicine, who I do some work with, and, and it took a couple of years. But I would say the things you start low hanging fruit, uh, things like for bowls of fresh apples in the waiting room, right? Encouraging uh, people, uh, uh, you know, I would say with what you serve to staff, you know, switching up from pizza and, and deli sandwiches to ordering from the local Mediterranean restaurant and getting a big Greek salad. Um, ideas for eating olive oil. Oh, We've got to Google me and olive oil and then see me and Carson Daly doing shots on the day show. I just got this uh, thing sent to me that apparently they say that trend peaked when I did that, which I, I had no idea, but it made me feel, again, help my fragile ego. ego. But the, the ways that I eat olive oil is I put it on my vegetables and I saute them or oven roast them. Oven at 400 degrees, chop them up, mix the olive oil and whatever, potato, asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, garlic, put it on a sheet pan, with parchment paper usually to as less mess, slide it in. I don't know, 15, 20 minutes later, they're perfect. Um, protein shakes, 17 year old athlete kids love them. You know, I, I, how do I put this? I bought some protein. I bought like a little thing of pea protein to put in my protein shakes because I thought my kids might use it. And I, I just don't, you know, when I want to put proteins in shakes, I use almond butter, nut butter. Uh, you know, I think for the elderly, for adolescents, for athletes, it, you know, people always think they need a lot more protein. It's not that hard to get protein if you're eating meat and seafood um, or things like lentils, right? A couple of lentils has 19 grams of protein, I think. Uh, so, and actually in the most recent cookbook, I have a weight uh, smoothie that had a berry smoothie that has some white beans in it. But I, my thought on the protein is you want to look and just see what else is in there. Because a lot of these protein shakes for athletes and performance, they're filled with all kinds of theobromines and, and green tea extracts and caffeines and, and all these things that are just, uh, you know, in multivitamin, basically. So if a kid's taking a multivitamin and a protein powder, you know, they're just potentially getting way too much. I don't know, like selenium or zinc or things that you just, you know, copper. Um, so those are some of my thoughts on that. Olive oil, stevia um campus nutrient low-hanging fruit bowls of fruit nuts 
themes, right? So um, in, in terms of another, like this is the cafeteria, just, you know, power vegetable of the month, right? Or incentivize kids. It's like with people stopping drinking and smoking and change behavior. I always like it when you can reward them either with cash or, you know, if they can give people, you know, like uh, if you, you know, swipe your card and eat this many vegetables, you get some sort of credit. I mean, those are always programs that help incentivize people. And then little things, little tents to put on the table about eating for brain health, super easy to print up. And just for mental health awareness month in May, um, for any of the Alzheimer's awareness month this month, just having a brain food, little tent connecting food and mental health. Those are the kind of things I think are helpful. Thanks everybody. Sorry to go on and on and go over and ramble on about how much I miss my daughter. Uh, <laughs> it's fun to see everybody. And, and those of you who had your camera on, thanks. It's nice to see a few smiling faces. Um, any other questions, everybody? I'm going to go thoughts on coconut. Oh, best fermented foods you eat and how. All right. Best fermented foods. I think kombucha is a good place to start. Um, look for low sugar. I look for like 40 to 60 calories. I start with the gingers. Um, like any product now that it's kind of blown up as a market, but I try to get a lot of like botanicals and interest at, you know, lots of interesting kombuchas also for anybody who's stopping drinking or I stopped drinking like nine months ago and the booch is really, really helpful. But if you're really trying to get off, be careful. There's a little alcohol in there sometimes. Um, so kefir is my top, all the smoothie books, all the smoothies in my books use kefir. It's a fermented dairy product. It's more liquidy than yogurt. Any, you know, fermentation, you're chewing up the sugar, the bugs are eating the sugar. So most of the lactose is going to get eaten. It's going to get more acidic. You're going to digest some of the proteins, even the bugs will for you. So it's kind of like pre-digestion. The reason I like the kefir is it has so many colony forming units. And, and I was one of those people, like I'd, I'd go to the like probiotic part. I'd like sit there calculating like 5 billion, 50 billion, like, $18, $22. I was like trying to calculate how many colony forming units you're getting per dollar and which strands. And I just like getting it from food. So they say the three K's, uh, kombucha, kefir, and kimchi are the places to start. And then some of these foods, you know, depending on your cultural origin are really meaningful, right? For people who you know grew up around kimchi and haven't eaten it in a while for whatever reason. I mean, you can imagine all the mental health impacts of that, of helping reconnect. Again, this question, is it scope? I don't know, reconnecting one of your clients, patients with their cultural origin via their food. How's that not in your scope? And that sounds like super me. That's like, it's not exactly what you do. Yeah, if you don't tell them like, oh, now you should eat 16 grams of lentils or like, oh, you're from this country. Like, but I, again, I don't think that's how any of you practice, right? That's not, and so uh, there's all kinds of ways to weave it in. I think that that is within your scope. Um, and then uh, best fermented foods, the other miso. And then I just like going to these restaurants that do lots of ferments, right? Where they, they're they proud and they've got little fermented vegetables, a little this. Um, and then coconut oil. You know, coconut oil, it just it became popular because of one influencer putting butter in coffee and one study saying that people who eat, or people who are trying to be in ketosis that eat more, coconut oil can tolerate a little bit more carbohydrate. It's then gotten built as a cleaner fat, a, a fat that burns faster. All the cardiologists are up in arms. Everybody's eating more saturated fats. I like a little coconut oil. I, you know, I, I think it's kind of nice on like, so it gives a little, I don't know, tropical flavor uh, for my vegetables. Um, I, I like it and some curries, for example. But I don't think it needs to be a primary fat. There's nothing special about it. I, I, um, uh, you know, if it's something, that, again, for a lot of people, I also think it's one of those things, the main is, like my question about coconut is like, my thoughts on coconut oil is how much olive oil did you eat last week? That's my main thought on coconut oil. And once people get that dialed in, they're like olive oil in it up and they're eating lots of fish, then like, you know, a little coconut oil wants to creep in. Like, I got no problem with that. That's, that's interesting, but it's not like something that I feel people need to go seek as a solution to their health problems. Also the per person who popularized that hates and spreads misinformation about kale, which I've had a hard time being mature and not commenting publicly about over the last month. It's been hard for me. Says he says kale has as a high oxalate food. Do you know what kale is actually the definition of? It's the definition of a low oxalate green. 
like if you go to a dietitian and they're like, oh, I'm making kidney stones. Like my doctor says I need to be on a low oxalate diet and I love spinach. You're like, you should swap out that spinach and eat kale because kale has, like, or arugula because they have very few oxalates. Whereas like a cup of decaf coffee has more oxalates than a cup of kale. So here we are fighting misinformation at uh, 520 Eastern time on a, on a Monday afternoon. I've, I've got to go um, run. Uh, I hope I'll see some of you on Instagram. Uh, we've got some info up on Triad. So please check out the platform. Um, I'm really enjoying the Triad folks and kind of, so uh, I'm sure everybody here's registered, but spread the word. It's just, I, I just love the idea. I love getting involved over the last few months of just that we can have a community of mental health clinicians like that. I, I just think it's, I don't know. I go on LinkedIn and I just feel like, I don't know, sad that I'm not like some billionaire tech bro or whatever, or like started some app, like, or whatever, have some fancy title, but I like the triad community. It's nice. So, all right. I'm glad this was helpful, everybody. My team and I are here to help in any way. Thanks for being a great audience and take care of yourself. You guys are doing the best and hardest work. So don't forget that it, it really is hard. It's been really hard for all of us in mental health. So, you know, keep, keep on keeping on, but take care of yourself. It's really, really important that we all stay strong. I'll see y'all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.